All right, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining here in the fourth session of our leading transformation track. My name is Chris Malaster. I'm the member of the Matrix board here and also the CEO and founder of Ingenium Digital Health Advisors. And innovation has been the, at the, ever, ever since I joined healthcare, I think a year, year after joining healthcare, I got looped into uh, in innovation and transformation and quality improvement. And so I always com combine the two. It's been 20 years now. I uh, was part of the first uh, Center for Innovation iteration at the Mayo Clinic and saw uh, firsthand what does not work. <laughs> so very, uh, uh, excited to hear about how to take team-based uh, innovation here to the next level. And uh, I know that David and Anissa are experienced speakers and will share with you whatever they feel they need, you need to know about them and their expertise. But both of them have uh, long decades of experience in healthcare and in, in that intersection of innovation. And with that, and further ado, please join me in welcoming Anissa and David. Yes, um, so we have uh, 20 virtual participants as well. So, um, and our moderator is uh, Shannon McDivitt. So Dr. McDivitt, do you wanna give your intro? I'd be happy to, and I extend my welcome to everyone in the room and in the virtual room with me now. I'm Shannon McDevitt. I'm a family physician and have been serving in federal um, environment for the past 12 years. I am currently with the Health Resources and Services Administration, working with the Health Center program. Great, thank you so much. And um, uh, by all means, chime in with the chat from the virtual participants uh, anytime you'd like to. So, and we invite you guys to ask questions throughout. Don't wait till the end. Just throw them out there. We'll make this as participatory uh, as possible. So, um, so I'm Dave Eilers. I'm here with Anissa Davenport. We have a firm called Possibility Partners. That's the big uh, logo that you see there. Um, I've worked for a variety of medical device companies, but the way I like to introduce myself is um, my uh, best days in healthcare. And actually, some of my best days in healthcare were overseas. I was on the board for a healthcare clinic in Kenya and felt compelled to help those folks um, uh, innovate and iterate and create impact which oddly enough started with fresh water. So we put wells in the schools, in the primary schools. And then once they had fresh water, we built our clinic. After we built the clinic, we needed a way for people to get to the clinic. So we raised money for an ambulance. And then the next thing was uh, we did child and maternal health, preventing AIDS in uh, the population there. And then after those children were surviving, we had a Thrive Through Five program so that we could get them vaccinated because if they lived to age five, their mortality was much better. And so that's what I always, um, yeah, I've done lots of things, but the most impactful work is where you're starting where there is no infrastructure. And uh, so I've done both ends uh, where there is infrastructure and we have to get out of our own way and where there's absolutely no structure. There wasn't even power we were running on generators in those first days of Luwala. So, Anissa? Thanks, Dave. Hi, I'm Anissa Davenport, and I've spent the majority of my career in healthcare in different leadership roles. But what I like to talk about when we're thinking about innovation is work that I did at a health system called Vident Health, now branded ECU Health, and a um, very rural uh, health center, uh, health system, um, lots of several hospitals, academic medical center, and rural hospitals across uh, geography about the size of the state of Maryland. So with 1.4 million people spread out. So transportation um, and being able to get access to care was really a huge um, challenge. And so um, one of the things I had the privilege of doing is working with um, a team to create care innovations. And that was really our um, strategy and focus around how can we bring access to care to the people. So one of the first things we did pre-pandemic, so this was back in 2016, was how can we make primary care available to everyone 24-7? You know, 
we have the doctor's offices open, you know, eight to five. I don't know about you, but I don't get sick only from eight to five. <laughs> so how do we make that available? And then we started thinking, how do we leverage our resources that we have? So we had this footprint of facilities, so over 100 different physician practices all throughout Eastern North Carolina. How can we leverage that plus the specialty care that we have and actually create virtual outreach clinics so we're taking the care to the people? So we would have the patients go to their local facility and then have a nurse um, at their side and using technology, the specialist was able to conduct an assessment and see that patient without the patient having to drive. So it saved the physician windshield time from having to go out into the communities and it saved the patient and the family the expense and the challenge sometimes of being able to get there. So those are some of the things just as you're thinking about, we're thinking about innovation um, that, that are very practical and that made a huge difference. And so we look forward to exploring more with you today. Good, so you have access to our slides, which have changed slightly, because there's always updates, um, including a link at the end, but we'll, we'll get there shortly. Um, so let me just advance this. We've done intros, so we accomplished that. So just a little bit about, great. I wanted to see that, thank you. Um, so just our perspective, um, <clears throat> on um, the unrealized potential. So I did some work with the American Hospital Association and we took a poll of people in innovation roles and those around them. And um, people had a lot of ideas, um, more than they had courage. So um, it takes courage to put your ideas, I'm seeing a lot of nods around the room. I don't know how we do virtual nods, but, um, Shannon will figure out a way to do that. So there's unrealized potential in individuals, in teams, and in organizations. It's almost like uh, a phrase I've heard is there's Rembrandts in the attic. Um, there's masterpieces, and the question is how do we find those, how do we de-risk those, and how do we get them implemented? So we're, um, by the way, uh, part of what I do is I teach corporate entrepreneurship at uh, a grad school and a law school at Syracuse University. And one of my rules is the students always do half the work. So this is the participatory part. I'd like you to organize yourself both online and in the room in triads, um, two or three people, there you go, and answer these three questions. So, this is at the end of the conference. People are shuffling right now. <laughs> so um, these are the three questions. What are your takeaways so far? So this is the end of the transformation track. So you've heard a lot of content. We've heard a lot of examples. Um, what are your takeaways so far? Second of all, whatever you're going to do when you get back home, who are you going to do that with? Who are your team members? Who are your allies? Um, Atul Gawande says doctors are always trained as cowboys, but they need to operate as pit crews. So who are your teammates? Who's on your pit crew? And then lastly, where do you anticipate hurdles in your, in your change? So if you're going to engineer a transformation, they are going to be blockers. they are going to be decision makers. they are going to be requirements that you need to satisfy. So what are those hurdles? So for the folks online, I know when you go into your breakouts, you're not gonna see these questions. So just write down uh, takeaways, team, and hurdles, okay? And we'll give you about five to seven minutes to talk, and then we'll do a report out, and we're going to gather information of what you've learned so far, okay? Any questions in the room? Okay. All right. Seven minutes. Ready, go. I have my stopwatch. <laughs>
We know this isn't enough time, but try to wrap up in the next minute. Okay, so let's do a little report out, both virtually and, no, I'm going to ask for volunteers. And there is a prize for going first. <clears throat> okay, so share, so um, we know that three questions is hard in five, six minutes. So um, if you just share um, some of your takeaways, we'd love to hear about what you've learned so far, both, and we'll queue up the virtual audience as well. But somebody want to start in the room? I'll start. Okay. And this one for Ron Nye. This is when I'm getting training. Here you go. Salandra. Um, this is from Salandra okay. from North Carolina. And what three things will she want to implement in the next 30 days? Um, the first thing is analyze the needs of the community. Second, what's the current climate within the state? And what's a realistic goal? Okay. Can you uh, say more about climate? So in North Carolina, we are on the verge of Medicaid expansion. And understanding the climate and the uh, community, both on the state, local level side, with these conversations of Medicaid expansion, um, and what a resource like telehealth brings to that conversation, being able to um, know what their expectations are <laughs> and what we can actually ask for as, co as a community coalition, because that's our organizations, as we're an intermediary. So really being able to understand who, all, who the players are and also what we can ask in those conversations as it moves forward so that it benefits at the end the patient. Okay, so you said community, just recap those. Oh, oh I said analyze the needs of the community. community. Um, what's the cultural climate in the state? Cultural climate. And what is a realistic goal? Goal, okay. And so we've written three things down, um, mindset, that's a category, something that changed your mind, some new information, a method, so you're analyzing um, and modeling. So you might, at, at the end, say, hey, what's our realistic goal? That's our starting point. That's where we want to model. So, all right, another group. I'm walking to the back of the room. Oh, yes. The, which one of the first prizes do you want to? give out. I'm thinking, yeah. Yep. So I mentioned that um, when I was working with the AHA, we did some polling and there were a lot of good ideas, but not a lot of courage in organizations. So this is one of my favorite books by David and Tom Kelly. They're the founders of a firm called IDEO and it's called Creative Confidence. So for going first, Bonnie Britton gets this book. So I said there were prizes, right? Okay. Somebody else? Another team? I can go next for the two of them you guys uh, add on. Uh, <clears throat> so we didn't exactly follow like this uh, framework in the discussion. We identified... You mean you were creative? We were very... Creative. I think that's allowed. <laughs> okay. Perfect. <laughs> uh, uh, the insight that I think we shared that it was more like evolution of existing ideas versus 
coming up with something completely new in the next 30 days. Mm -hmm. uh, so Matthew is going to uh, cut costs essentially at the schools by replacing uh, nurses with medical assistance and technology. Mm -hmm. uh, Jonathan is figuring out how to empower the uh, clinician on site at the elementary schools to offer more virtual care visits. Mm -hmm. And Nathan is looking to kind of expand the work that he's been doing with his poster to get more buy-in from other stakeholders. And my plan, actually, I've met quite a few fantastic people, and I had the idea of doing a podcast. Mm -hmm. So I've recruited a few folks who said a soft yes <laughs> to go ahead with me. So I'll need to do a lot of work kind of to set this up, and those people will help me define the exact questions for each, and then I need to figure out the promotional component. So these are the takeaways from our group. Uh, which one? Uh, the first one was about, about school-based clinics. Yeah, maybe Matthew can talk about this. Yeah, we were just toying with the idea of replacing. Um, we have nurses in all of our uh, schools, uh -huh. and maybe replacing them with like a medical assistant or somebody like that who has a, you know, they're they're not quite as expensive, um, and and using some of this technology. So. Uh, okay. <laughs> Are you all nurses? Said by two nurses, <laughs> yes. <laughs> My mother's a nurse. I haven't told her I'm planning on doing this yet. Oh, you might get flack at Thanksgiving time. Well, it could be that we just don't have anything. So that's what we're looking at, is it having something instead of nothing. virtual? Well, that, and that's, that's what we're talking about yeah. doing, is having something virtual instead of having nothing at all. Right. Um, you think so. Yes. Have Oh, sorry. Um, the numbers are limited. It's really hard. But if you do virtual and then a nurse has a range, you could have a mix of both. So they're on site at different schools and then virtual the other times. And that, and I think that is something that. Yes, I have. Okay. Yes, I have. In, in fact, um, and I'm the IT guy, so. Yeah. You know, um, I'm speaking for, we, we actually had... We have the clinical of, side, the IT side. Yes, our Group head of problem solving is what yes. we have. Our head of yeah. nursing was here yesterday, and I'm, I'm speaking for her, and I probably shouldn't be, so. <laughs> <clears throat> but that's why you got called on, so. Yes. All right, so second prize for the group, and we will have uh, the virtual groups go here in a second. But this one is called Orbiting the Giant Hairball. So this is uh, written by a guy named Gordon McKenzie, and he, dis he worked at Hallmark, and he's in charge of creativity. Now, you think of Hallmark cards, and you think everybody's creative at Hallmark, right? Not so. He said there, the corporation was a giant hairball. So he wanted to use the resources of the hairball, but he never wanted to get sucked into the hairball. So I'm going to give this to Igor. Igor based on our conversation earlier. That's why I said, ask your question later. Okay, Shannon, do, you, do we have Shannon's, um, do you have your camera on, Shannon? Do we get to see I you? I do. Okay. I do, hi Can everyone. you report out for some of those groups? Well, I'm gonna invite them to report out for themselves. Um, okay. It seems that the challenge of some small group work was a little intimidating to some of our virtual guests today. So okay. um, I'm going to call on um, Mike and Yvonne. Would either of you like to share the takeaways from your conversation? And I think if you just unmute yourself, you should be able to join with audio. Mike, do you want to go first? I just want to say that I've really enjoyed the entire conference and all that I've learned. Um, in regards to what Mike and I spoke about, we were both um, kind of talking about challenges in implementation and buy-in and making sure that you approach um, all the different parties um, with initiatives that you want to implement. And I hope I'm not speaking out of turn for Mike, but Basically, he was talking about um, from a technology standpoint of wanting to implement new initiatives and making sure to get buy-in from everyone involved. So a lot of communication um, and um, talking to different parties. Good. And then um, 
Amy, are you available to speak on the comments for your room? Amy, are you willing to come off mute? If not, uh, Shannon Burnett, would you consider? Yes, hello. Hi, great, thanks. Hi. Um, so my partner, her microphone wasn't working, so we, we didn't get to have um, a long conversation. Um, she works with the Department of Education in Virginia, and I'm with Penn State Health Virtual Services here in Pennsylvania. Um, and what I kind of talked about was, um, as far as changes, um, our virtual health team, we're a small but mighty team uh, here at Penn State Health, and we have a lot of initiatives and changes that we want to make. Um, probably our biggest hurdles are buy-in and support from leadership and other um, departments within the health system. Um, you know, it's a lot for some people to swallow, just having to do things differently than they're used to. And where's the future of telehealth going? And, um, you know, why should we change what we've been doing? Those kind of um, issues, those are probably some of our big hurdles, um, along with technology in general. Um, you know, a lot of the systems we use were not built for the virtual world. Um, and so, you know, at some point we need to make a transition into some better technology. Um, so those were kind of some of the things that we, we talked about. Good, but it sounded like, um, so sort of executive sponsorship was key. Um, getting permission um, was another thing that I heard. And then um, sort of getting over the hurdles of the way we've always done it. The, I define status quo as Latin for the mess we're in. Um, so it's kind of like we have to get over that. Um, and then once we get the permission and get that hurdle, um, those requirements met, then you can move on to the technology. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more, but Whatever new idea you're de-risking for, is it desirable? Is it feasible? Is it sustainable as, as a model? So um, Anissa will take over from here. So thank you so much. So um, it's great to hear what's important and where you want to focus because we think that we'll have some opportunities to things to share with you today, tools for you to take back home um, to make this time not only fun that we've all had together, but um, practical moving forward. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, what we believe is absolutely essential for innovation, and that is teamwork. We've all said, we've all been part of teams, um, and we all think we know what does good teamwork look like, but we know that from our own perspective and not necessarily from the other people that we're working with. So one of the things we're going to talk about today is how can you find out what's important to the team that you're working with. One of the reasons that we think teamwork is so important is because the data tells us that 75% of cross-functional teams are underperforming. I mean, that is tremendous, and I'm sure each of you have experienced it. So how many of you had a good idea that never got implemented, right? So it's not that we don't have good ideas. There's a ton of good ideas. Getting them implemented is really hard, and the way through is teamwork. So um, we want to talk about teamwork in conjunction with task work. Most of the time, we focus on task work. We focus on, like, well, how, what do we need to do to get the job done? How do we need to move this forward? Well, if we do that without teamwork, then we find that the, there are barriers that are in place, and sometimes we don't, can't even see them. They're happening behind the scenes, right? And there are things that you didn't know were going on that were re resistance to what you're trying to make happen. If you start with teamwork, if you start with really making sure the team is aligned and, and, and together, that is gonna help the task work accelerate. So let me tell you a little bit more. One of the ways to do that that we think is really important is creating the conditions of success for high-performing teams. 
So again, everything we're sharing with you is well researched by the London School of Economics. And we, are, we like to talk about it in three areas, clarity, climate, and competence. So clarity is being, am I clear about the, the goals, the roles, um, the purpose, the vision, what is it we're trying to do? Climate is all, all of those things that support the team. So it's everything from structure, do we have the right structure, the processes, um, the things that need to be in place, resources for the team to be able to work effectively together. And then the competence is really around the skills, the knowledge, and the attitude. So out of these three, which one or two do you think is the driver of success? Just the clarity. Nice. Clarity? and climate. Those two are the drivers. So when we see um, the results of a team assessment, we use a team assessment that really is like a diagnostic, it's like an x-ray of the team. It's um, really, again, researched around these conditions of success and team members are able to say what is important and then how present is it on that team. And that gap and variability is what we look at and how we close the gap and the variability. And I'll share that with you in just a minute. But these, those two, if you focus on climate and, and oh, excuse me, clarity and climate, that really drives the change and the dynamics in the team. We often find that in healthcare teams that we're working with that if we start with climate and focus on that first, that actually helps influence, excuse me, we start with clarity first, that helps influence the climate because when people, when you hear words like, I'm confused, I don't understand, I don't know what we're doing, that's when you really have the clarity problem and a lot of times it's around their role and they don't want to say that so that's a really important piece to think about. So another piece that we want to share with you is um, you may have heard of Google Aristotle project. Um, they did a big study on teamwork and there were 180 t Google teams that were um, uh, uh, studied and what they found to be most important out of all the things for teamwork is psychological safety. And if you think about it, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna innovate, you have to have psychological safety and the ability to be able to share ideas and take risk and not feel embarrassed um, about what you're sharing or bringing up or if someone to think that, that you're not smart or that's a, a dumb idea. There just are no bad ideas. We just have to think about what will work. Um, you know, dependability is also important and that's being able to count on each other. So these are, these are all factors that lead into high performing teams. And we just wanna make sure the takeaway here is that you start with psychological safety. That is foundational. So you have to get to know each other. Um, you have to know what's important to each other. All those, especially on virtual, sometimes we'll jump straight in and start talking about the work at hand or the meeting and don't have that small talk as much. And I would really encourage you if you, when you can, have those conversations, find out what's important to people, how their day's going, how their family's doing. All of those things start to build relationships and create greater psychological safety to be able to share things with one another. So I mentioned this um, research, uh, this uh, assessment that we use. And so this is just a report out of a real team that we worked with. And what it shows us is where does this team have the highest gaps? So for example, on this particular team, a clear goal was where they had the highest gaps. So that was one of the areas that the team decided to focus on. And that's the other thing, when we get these results back, we ask the team what, what they wanna focus on. It's not the leader making that decision, it's the team. And actually the leader participates as a team member. So it sets a level. Um, so everybody's on the same page, everybody's voice is being heard. And I think that's really important. We have found that to be very powerful and it's a really positive experience for the leader because it takes the pressure off the leader and they get to see their team step up to the plate because sometimes leaders feel like, well, my team's not moving and I can't get them to do what I need to, so I'm just gonna tell them more. <laughs> And, and that doesn't really generate the behaviors that you're looking for. So, um, so we look at the gaps and then we say, well, where do we have the lowest score? So where did you score low and how can we strengthen those? And then the last piece is where's their variability? So when we do this diagnostic, we find out that some team members are scoring um, certain aspects of five. Like they're very clear on what their role is, for example, and others may be scoring it a one. So when we see that variability, it's, it's all confidential, so we don't know who, but we can say, 
we've got some ones and fives here. What's going on? Sometimes we found um, that when so it, sometimes it's the people who've been there a long time versus the people that are new to the organization, things like that. But we are able to talk about that in the dialogue. So this is a diagnostic tool to create the right dialogue to really have great teamwork and close that gap on um, the cross-functional teams not being, um, not performing. So all of this is to accelerate. So this is an example. When we did this work, we, we only asked teams to do two or three things, focus on two or three things. Um, in this particular team, we focused in on climate. You can see that yellow line that's going straight up. Well, what happens is that everything rises. Uh, when you focus on the right things and you can see the overall um, growth for that team and feeling more like a team really um, accelerated. When we took the survey, and you can take it as often as you want to, it's the way the license works, but we did it when we do our 90-day um, boot camps, innovation boot camps, we'd take it at the beginning and then a lot of times we'll hear we don't know each other well enough to take this um, survey. You know, why are we taking this? They want to get it right. You know, and we're like, just just answer to the best of your ability because we're going to have a conversation around it. And so if any data is wrong, you will be able to talk about it. 95% of the time, the data is spot on and, and the dialogue confirms that. So we take it at midpoint and we see progress, progression like this. And then we have had some teams that have absolutely closed the gap 100% on what was important to them and now how present is it on that team. And they have fun and they perform and they accomplish things they never thought they would be able to do. So Dave is going to walk us through a case study just like that. Thank you. So before I do that, um, any questions so far, um, psychological safety, Igor? Wait for the mic. and I'm a consultant myself. To me, the biggest question is not lack of clarity. It's about like the environment, the psychology, team dynamics. And I think usually these are the things where people get discouraged, mm -hmm. not because they don't know something. It's not that the knowledge space, in my understanding, it's more about the culture of the organization. And if the culture is wrong, if your leaders are not listening to you, mm -hmm. uh, if you don't have great relationships with your colleagues and everyone is kind of driving for political reasons, not for the benefit of the organization, if there is a culture of fear, if actual conflict is not allowed, no matter how much clarity you create, it will be hard to make progress. So I'd like to, I'm sure you have it, but I'd like you to highlight the link between those like intellectual insights and real life challenges of an organization that doesn't always have a perfect culture. Thank you. Do you want to go first? Sure. No, that's. Well, you can keep that back there. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. I, I think that that is absolutely the key. The assessment is just a conversation piece. It's all about the dialogue. And so what we do is we facilitate that dialogue with the team members. We do it instead of the leader so that the leader, again, is not influencing or people are feeling uncomfortable about that. And we look at those areas. And, you know, sometimes the leader is shocked that there's not a clear goal. And so we start peeling back the onion and say, well, what do we mean by goal? Okay? I mean, or sometimes what do we mean by a plan, having a plan? So not everybody has the same idea what a plan is. So. That's the conversation that we have, and, and it gets everybody on the same page, and we make sure we hear from every single person throughout the process, right, in the conversation. That's really important, so that everybody's voice is heard. And that really just starts to, I mean, you can see the weight falling off people's shoulders when they say, this is going to be different. It's signaling this is going to be different. So, um, you know, in this particular one, um, we had a lot of dialogue around the goal there weren't measures of success that, that people felt um, that were well understood. And then they also didn't think it was achievable. So you're asking us to do something that we don't feel like it's possible and maybe we didn't have the resources. So that's an example. That team decides what they want to focus on. So out of all those things, um, and then if you look at um, effective process for decision making, again, that's an area where they scored low in the climate, in the culture piece, right? So we don't know how 
how to how we're going to decisions are going to be made. So then they lose confidence that this is actually going to happen, and and then you're wasting my time. And so all of that stuff comes out in the beginning. That's why we ask people to take the assessment up front when you're just getting together. The story we're going to share with you is about a team that some of them had never even met each other when they walked into the room. Some of them had only heard about each other through reputation um, across the system, and they weren't excited about working with each other. So <laughs> That never happens, right? Yep. You can keep that. David and Anissa, could you share with us once again the um, diagnostic tools that you're using? Oh, sure. Um, so the diagnostic tool is called Squadify. It was developed in Australia, and they call their team squads, S-Q-U-A-D-I-F-Y, um, squadify.net. Um, and it's a very simple tool. There's 37 questions that the team asks uh, and answers. And then that's the data that this comes from. Um, and that's what generates the dialogue. So just a couple of other things, and then if there's other questions from the online audience. Um, so uh, there is a researcher at Harvard, Amy Edmondson, who wrote a book called The Fearless Organization. And uh, part of what we talk about, so some things are structural and some are team dynamics. So one of the structures is, and we'll talk about how you, the roles in a team, but some key roles are every two weeks you report out to your executive sponsors. So they know what you're doing to de-risk your idea. So every two weeks they're getting, here's what we've done, here's what we're planned to, do, planned to do, and here are our hurdles. And if there's a hurdle that they can't resolve, then that's the role of the executive sponsor. So that's sort of the structural piece. Um, the other piece is uh, and it didn't come up here, but can you have straight talk without offense? Can you uh, uh, tolerate failure without blame? So those are some of the things that are part of that diagnostic tool. Um, were there other questions on the, Shannon, that we can answer at this point? Not at this time, thank you. Okay, so we'll keep going. Um, so one of the things I'm going to invite you to um, uh, Google afterward is uh, a little video on YouTube, and uh, it's called Napkin Powder Puff 2015. You're going to think I'm crazy, but it's a drumline video. And you'll see how a drumline, as, as an example, as a team, plays together and how they switch leadership and how they exchange roles, but they're always playing as a team. It's about a two minute video and it's a lot of fun. What, can you say that again? Napkin, uh -huh. Powder Puff, 2015. I wanna make sure I've got that. Okay, thank you. I looked at it again this morning just to make sure that it was the right. <laughs> Napkin, Powder Puff, 2015. I sent it to Anissa yeah. too, so she could back me up. Okay, so uh, this is about a team that we worked with in Massachusetts, and we have their permission to share a few things about their team. But it, um, we know we have a good team when after our um, sprint calls, our, our uh, scrum calls, which are two or three times a week, maybe 20 to 30 minutes, they're not long. Um, I call them virtual stand-ups. Anissa and I will call each other after the call and say, wasn't that great when this team member weighed in on this? And, and so we can reinforce those dynamics in the team. Um, so their challenge was a behavioral health challenge. So you can, you've all experienced this yourself. You know, there's sort of nine squares giving the stats. But, you know, post-COVID, we are in a mental health crisis, number one. Number two, it's affecting children, um, you know, five years and up. Um, and obviously with um, substance use disorder, it's really acute in uh, teen populations. And then the third thing is providers are not exempt. I mean, our providers were getting, seeking care themselves. And it, when we looked at these stats and we created a problem to solve statement, we'll talk a little bit more about that. 
there was passion. Um, we talked about the impact they wanted to have, and then we also talked about the imperative. And we'll talk about that in a second. So uh, we had a two-day boot camp, and during the boot camp, we, we covered all three of these things. We covered mindset, we covered uh, some methodologies, we have a, a participant guide for the boot camp, and uh, you know, what we wanted them to model. Um, one of the principles is when you get to the ideation phase, you do want ideas from everybody. And quantity of ideas leads to quality of ideas. And so it's very important to have a lot of ideas because then you can do the sorting exercise and you can prioritize. And then uh, we had doctors and administrators uh, work with pipe cleaners, Play-Doh, and googly eyes. That's why Anissa is the minister of fun. <laughs> so we, we had great fun going to Target the night before and putting these tools on the table and say, here's another principle. When it comes to creating your first prototype, you wanna show and not tell. And I'll talk about why that's important. So sometimes prototypes are very rough. It can start with literally a napkin drawing. Um, and then it gets um, a little more sophisticated as you do interviews. So when we did our brainstorming in the boot camp, we broke them out into three groups. A, a group for patients, a group for providers, and a group for family caregivers. And so they created a prototype and then we melded this so that we could do interviews and say, are we on the right track? Um, they're very simple interviews and uh, we had a brief script. There were five or six questions, but what you're looking for is a reaction to your prototype. And so if you show and don't tell, you can ask what would work well in this scenario? Second question is what wouldn't work well? And what would be even better? That last question, EBI, is really important. Even better if, because then you're getting their ideas and you're co-creating with patients, providers, and family caregivers. So then we created this, this model. And again, each stage, we're, we're sharing this with the executive sponsors. So we're getting their buy-in and we're not surprising them at the end of 90 days and saying, hey, we want a boatload of money to do X, Y, or Z. And if any of you attended the yikes, I don't have time to innovate, what's the number one objection when you share a new idea? It's not in the budget, <laughs> right? Um, that's the easiest thing. And Igor and I were talking earlier, there are 10 people, 10 roles in any organization that can say no, but they can't necessarily say yes. We call those blockers, you know. So you have to find out, well, what are the requirements of the blockers and how do we get around that? Well, we get around it by de-risking our ideas and getting the voice of the customer. Again, patients, providers, and uh, family caregivers in this case. So um, that's just very quick, um, you know, one scenario. We've um, coached teams uh, virtually that we've never met in uh, states, cold states in the Midwest that we don't want to travel to in the winter. <laughs> That's why we're here in Virginia in March. Um, so we can do it virtually, but it's really uh, much more effective, especially in large organizations. And I would say academic medical centers being one, um, if you can meet in person, launch the team, take the diagnostic, have the dialogue, and then march along as a team. So a few more specifics about that. And we might need a wardrobe change. <laughs> okay, so we wanna leave you with uh, some tools for um, building communities of innovation practice. So I wanna start by asking everyone to look on there table and do you have a pair of glasses in front of you? Does anyone have a pair of glasses? All right, take them out of the package if you haven't already. And I want you to put them on. And we're okay. sorry about excluding the online right. team. 
Now, when you put these colored glasses on, does it change your view? See things a little differently? <laughs> yeah, we, need, we should have take out the clear glasses, right? So, and Dave, if you'll do the honors of taking a photo of, of this good looking group. So, these are just some fun to say, to take home, to remind you that sometimes I just need to look at things a little differently. And that's all that it takes is that mindset of thinking about things from a different lens and ideally from through a lens of innovation. So these can just represent your lens of innovation and just a little fun to take home with you. And it's simple things like that that you can do that signal to a team, hey, this project's gonna be fun. We're gonna do something different. We're gonna make something happen. We're gonna see things differently because one thing I know is my personal experience was we would talk about things, it would take so long to implement, and a lot of times it never made the light of day because some kind of crisis, some kind of regulatory change, something happened that focused the attention and energy on the, the things that were broken that need to be fixed versus trying to do something new and different. And I, I used to say, well, hold on, I've got a file for that. Let me get that and pull that forward, right? We've talked about that before. We've already talked about that before, but here's, here's what we have. This is, we really want to do something different with innovation. And that's one of the reasons that Dave and I are so passionate about this work is because we believe it starts with teamwork and then applying the principles of innovation. And that is where we have seen organizations make significant changes the case study we just showed, some of the comments we've had is how much they enjoy each other on the team, how tight they are. Every time we listen in to their sessions, we're just amazed how each other jumps in and takes the lead and helps the other one out and comes up with more ideas and is so supportive. That I think they really look forward to those meetings, which is, I don't know about you, but it's hard to look forward to meetings. <laughs> and they've moved faster than they've ever moved before. And that, that's the results that, that we're looking for. So we want to leave you with a couple of things. So um, Dave, I think you're going to talk a little bit about a problem to solve. Yeah, so I touched on it earlier. Um, Helps if you have the mic on. Um, so these are things, that, you know, a wicked problem to solve is something you can't lean your way out of. So lean is not doing stupid stuff. Um, you know, and there's, there's other techniques in terms of, you know, value creation, but this is creating new, new. This is doing something new that will affect or impact people in new ways. And so that's the wicked problem. Um, how does it impact people? Be real specific about who you want to impact. Um, so um, at Tufts, the uh, client in Massachusetts, they had a broad uh, mental and behavioral health continuum, but our team was focused on uh, PCPs and how to help primary care physicians start that process. Um, obviously, it can start with PHQ-9, but what, it, what are your choices? What are your options from there? How do you get that in EPIC? How do you get that in the non-EPIC practices? How do you escalate? You know, what are the meds? So we, there was training involved. There was a, a virtual uh, telehealth solution. Anyway, um, they were very specific. And then why is this imperative for change? What the team came up with in the boot camp was that mental and behavioral health was just as important as any clinical condition. They said mental and behavioral health is a right. Yeah. We didn't say that. They said that, that was their motivation. So you want to start out and say, hey, I'm sorry, I forgot your name already, but you said clear goal and uh, something that's doable, a good problem statement will help you get there and will help motivate the team along the way. So the other important piece is choosing the right team. So a lot of times when we're looking at choosing a team, we think about, well, let's get the naysayers on board so that they're part of the process. That's not who you want to choose for your innovation team. Not that you can't have anyone that's not you know, bought in yet, but you really want to be so clear on that problem you're trying to solve. And then 
identifying who are the executive sponsors, who are those, who's going to champion this or is willing to, to listen to this team and knock down barriers. Um, we use a scrum master and a scribe. That's really from agile development. And so the scrum master really is the person leading the team and making sure the team has what they need to be successful and, and has the clarity and the resources and the structure. And then the scribe is always documenting everything and all the decisions. And so we use repositories and tools that help it all be in one place. You're not having to go find an email, just things that we can do to really help the team focus on what they need to focus on. And then when you're choosing a team, yes, we need some subject matter experts, but we also need value creation experts. So people who, we call it the willing. If you're willing to look at things new and different and you've got that can-do attitude, that is really clear. So those are the roles um, that, we, that we look for. And we like to try to keep teams somewhere between 10 and 12. Um, any bigger than that, it's, it's too un unwieldy to do, um, move as quickly as you need to. And then the last thing we shared, I wanted to share with you a couple of things for innovation. So when you're looking at the building blocks for innovation, it's a combination of the clarity, climate, and competence. Um, we talked about the importance of psychological safety, a safe place to share ideas and information. Um, it's important that, that the squad, the team, is using the voice of the customer in making its plans. That is one of the number one thing we so many times get together and, and we just have our own internal view and we're coming up with solutions and it ends up being organizationally focused instead of really the people that you're trying to serve. So making sure you understand all the stakeholders, which are people in the organization as well as the patients and families you're serving. Um, we want, you have to be able to talk straight talk without offense. That's hard. That takes time and, and relationship and getting to know each other, but that's the best when you can talk straight. Um, and then failures without blame. You have to fail and fail fast because everything you do is not going to work. It's not going to be perfect. Celebrate that. We just learned what doesn't work. Great. Now we can go ahead and make these tweaks and move forward with an educated mindset. And then being positive and constructive. So if you're going to be on the team, we need you to be positive and constructive. That's really, really key. Um, sometimes people are oriented to try to find everything that's wrong. You just can't start there. You have to have all the ideas, then you layer on the constraints. If you put constraints up front, it really will keep the best ideas from coming forward. So a couple of key takeaways today. Um, we believe teamwork is vital to innovation work. So if you're going to do innovation, think about your team, choose the right team, and create the conditions of success. Mindset matters in choosing team members. So choose team members that have the right mindset. Conditions of success, everything we've talked about, accelerates the team performance and accelerates the work that you'll be doing. And then last but not least is the psychological safety is foundational. You have to have it for innovation. So there's more. We've told you a lot today, but we are, uh, Matrix is offering for us to do a series of four sessions after the conference because we always come to conferences and we hear all these great ideas and then we come back home and the dailiness gets in the way of the things that we have to do. So we are going to have four sessions um, where you come and actually practically do the work. So you come with a problem that you want to solve. In that first session, we're going to work with you on getting that problem really clear. That may seem obvious, but it's not. If you're really clear on what problem you're trying to solve, that is 50% of the work right there. Then we're going to talk a uh, second session on recruiting and innovation team. So just what we talked about. So if you have some questions about that and want to talk out loud with how do you do that? How do you know when someone has the right mindset? We can help with that. And then the third session will be developing the human centered prototype process that we just showed you um, with the Tufts example. And then last but not least, we'll, the last session will be overcoming object objections through storytelling. So um, there'll be four 90-minute sessions, um, and here is how you can sign up. Oh, sorry. Um, we have them currently scheduled for Wednesdays at noon, Eastern Standard Time, starting in April um, and running through May. So every other week, um, four sessions, and we'd love, love to have you. I think it's the first 20 organizations that sign up, um, and definitely bring at least one other person. So you've got to have two, but you can have up to three if you want. So um, let me stop there and see any questions about
this or the sessions today. There is an email um, that went out at 3.45 a.m. from <laughs> Kathy. I know. And uh, that has the link in it, and I've already gotten a few responses for people to sign up. Great. All right, any final words from you guys? Or any final questions? We're at time, and we've, we've got to get back to the uh, main hall at 2.00. So thank you very much, David and Anissa.